practice that's taking root uh, membership and loyalty programs uh, among our clubs. I think seven or eight clubs, I think, will be implementing some form of, of a membership or uh, loyalty program this year, the Indians among them. Uh, and really, you know, it's aimed at, at uh, you know, providing value to our, to our, to our uh, season ticket holders, uh, differentiating in some ways the, the, the primary market from the secondary market. Uh, learning most, probably, perhaps most importantly, learning more about who, who our customers are, uh, how they're utilizing their tickets, how they're uh, coming to the, when they're coming to the ballpark, what they're doing and purchasing within the ballpark, availing us of, of really important data that allows us to then uh, go back and market out to them uh, sort of on a one-to-one -one basis based on, on what they uh, sort of want out of uh, uh, the experience. So again, you know, I think, um, you know, looking to drive renewals, uh, engage our fans uh, and really provide value uh, that differentiates being a season ticket holder um, is really our, sort of at the heart of what the membership and loyalty uh, programs uh, are all about. Clubs are, are utilizing them or, or constructing these programs in different ways. Uh, I know that the, the San Diego Padres is an example that's uh, creating sort of a year-round membership program, almost like a country club type of environment where um, they're segmenting their fan base, uh, identifying uh, different segments that want different uh, sort of relationships with the brand uh, and providing them with, with the opportunities to experience uh, some of those uh, things, whether it's at the ballpark or outside the ballpark, that again, really bring unique value to, to being a seasoned seat holder. So again, I think it's another way that um, you know, we're looking to, uh, to, uh, to, to drive revenue uh, as it relates to uh, the relationship we have with ticket holders. And, and Andrew, from your perspective, um, you know, directly at the team, um, from, a, from a membership strategy uh, curious talking about you know the genesis of that idea um, and then actually I think a lot of what we're talking about and maybe we'll, we'll dive into the story within the story is actually taking that desire to do something and actually acting on it um, you know in the, the whole thought of progress and, and innovative thinking and, and actually applying it yeah. I mean, whether you call somebody a season ticket holder or a member uh, or something else our goal is to retain them year after year they're a recurring set source of revenue for us, so you know, you know what Dan described or what Zahir described in terms of their work. Our goal is to find ways that people will continue to come back to us uh, on a recurring basis. So in the past, and most teams do something like this, uh, we gave our fans, our season ticket holders, benefits, and it was a one-size-fits-all approach, and they all got a night in the suite and a few, you know, seats in a club, you know, section or something like that, you know, discount on merchandise. And everyone got the same thing. And it wasn't differentiated based on tenure with a club or spending or any behaviors that we actually wanted uh, to encourage from our fans. So we rolled out a loyalty program called Pride Rewards this year. Uh, it's not that different from if you think of uh, your airline mileage you know, clubs or you know, casino clubs or something like that, where we actually provide points to fans based on their uh, behaviors and then they can use those points uh, to spend on different uh, benefits. So those benefits could be the same things they were you know, buying in the past, uh, suites and, and club seats and things like that, or it could be unique experiences, autographed uh, memorabilia uh, and other items. How, and, and if you can, I mean the process internally, I think a lot of people in this room that are on teams or eventually gonna work for teams, um, you know, the, the idea process to actual implementation um, you know, a lot of what we've talked on the baseball side, um, you know, of, of this seminar and this, this conference has been, you know, the internal change. Um, and obviously, that's a fundamental, let's call it an evolution, maybe more than a shift. Yeah. Um, any, any lessons learned from that process? We have been researching loyalty programs for two to three years and trying to find the right uh, method that would work well for us. Uh, when we started rolling it out last summer, goal was to have it implemented uh, in line with our season ticket renewal invoices in August or September. So we were really launching it in internally, May, June, July timeframe. And people generally understood it, and it was more, how is this going to change how I have to interact uh, with the people I'm speaking to every day? Uh, I think actually Phil James said it yesterday, the, the ticket sales people are on the front line. They're the ones talking to the fans every single day. And when we make a change, uh, they're the ones that are going to hear it from the people they've been talking to for 20 years. So their mindset is, what is this going to mean for those conversations? So 
so we certainly tried to implement them with you know helpful information and uh, talking points and, and things of that nature. But uh, you know, it, it was a change, and when it got rolled out, there was a lot of questions from fans of what does it mean and, and how do I actually get this into my blog? Yeah, was, and, and I imagine then there's the internal change and the external change as well. I mean, Barry, um, you know, obviously going back to really helping the Giants and, um, you know, really revolutionizing the way that the ticket pricing is done. Um, internal and external, um, you know, communications, lessons learned and um, maybe some thoughts to share on, uh, on both of those. Yeah, sure. I mean, so we started out before we really did anything was, <clears throat> was talk to the fans. So we did a really comprehensive survey of season ticket holders trying to understand kind of what their, what their pain points were, what their concern would be about changing something that they've grown very used to, which was having set ticket prices. And once we were able to kind of understand kind of the concerns and the reaction in the market we got there, we were able to kind of position it in a way that we knew would be received favorably. So we put things in place like floors and season ticket price because we knew that was a big pain point for the fan the season ticket holder was feeling like someone got a better deal from an individual ticket sale. And so we, we eliminated that. <clears throat> we worked on our messaging to kind of point to where there was value for fans. And we actually realized that there was an entirely different set of concerns for a season ticket holder versus an individual fan. Right, An individual fan would be perfectly happy finding out that there was a discounted ticket way better than a season ticket holder was ever going to save, but the season ticket holder wasn't going to be happy about that. So we kind of broke up the messaging to highlight to the individual fans where they could get good deals and why this was value to them, while at the same time for the season ticket holder, highlighting how this wasn't going to change their value proposition. And to be fair, you know, things that you know Dan and Andrew have just been talking about, like like a rewards program or loyalty programs, I think are actually going to help that going forward because I think it's good to position it to a season ticket holder that their value isn't just sort of financial discount. But anyway, so we really kind of took all these steps and really figured out the strategy prior to announcing it. And then now we work with all of our clubs when they come on board to make sure that we kind of hand them the lines that they need to feed to the media, understand how we have to put the program in place to make sure that we're taking care of the fans going forward. And that's a really big part of a rollout across the board. Yeah. And, and I mean, that's, that's obviously part of it. I think people are probably more, it's safe to say more uh, aware from a consumer standpoint now than three years ago too. Yeah, no, I think they're I think they're much more aware now. Um, you know, Major League Baseball has done a lot in terms of actually displaying pricing for all teams across the board. I think that's something that you know again wasn't in place before, where you could actually go for a team and see what prices were for every game. So you know now this is in place. We do have some teams that roll it out without making a big announcement. Um, I think I think each market is still its own universe and in some ways kind of needs its own messaging and you need to educate your fans there. But now that it's known, you're right, it's not the same deal that it was for the first game. Yeah, and, and Zaheer, obviously NBA, um, roughly half the uh, amount of games, but still the, still the same challenges, right? Yeah, no, I think in terms of dynamic pricing, we see it as a, a pretty critical uh, you know, lever in our business. We've been dynamically pricing our games for, for three years now. Uh, I think uh, at least half teams do that. Uh, but, you know, just to echo some of the, the, the comments from, uh, from Dan and, and Andrew as well, uh, I think there's still a, a sort of a, a lot that, that we have to learn about, you know, what's the best strategy, uh, you know, how can we, uh, I think what's most interesting is how can we sort of influence our, our customer behavior based on how we sort of communicate our dynamic pricing strategy and how we uh, sort of implement it in the market. So whether that's driving uh, fans to specific areas of the stadium, whether that's Encouraging uh, sort of early purchase behavior. Uh, I think there's there's still a lot of sort of a lot we can do, a lot of testing and, and uh, uh, optimization there. But it's really a critical part of our, our strategy. Yeah, and, and so here, obviously, um, you know, this is your your second year um, with the Suns. You know, really diving into um, you know the the areas of all areas of the business. Um, maybe walk us through. I think one of the fascinating things about what the four of you do is. You know, really anything's on the table to study all these different variables, but, um, you know, going in and actually trying to tackle a problem or trusting the data that it discovers a, a new opportunity of, of understanding how that process works for you. Uh, sure, yeah, I think, um, you know, I think you touched on this earlier, but, uh, you know, as, as an analytics team at the Phoenix Suns, we are sort of a, a shared resource. 
across the organization. So, you know, uh, sort of look for areas within uh, each of our business areas, whether that be ticket sales, corporate partnerships, or, you know, operations. And, you know, half of the challenge is, you know, finding the right data, doing the right analysis. The other half is sort of getting your, uh, sort of your ideas implemented, uh, getting sort of buy-in. Uh, so I think, you know, uh, one of the, uh, sort of one of the important uh, uh, activities is really sort of building relationships between the, uh, the folks who do the analysis and also the folks who are in charge or are the sort of the, the front line, right? So the, the ticket sales uh, leadership, our, our corporate partnership guys, the ones who are sitting face to face with our clients, uh, face to face with our customers. So really uh, understanding what their perspective is, uh, understanding what their challenges are, uh, and really sort of taking that into account when you're doing your analysis or coming up with a strategy. Because at the end of the day, if there's not buying internally, then it's, it's very hard to sort of roll things out. Yeah, and I, and I think even, you know, part of it too is this whole issue of, um, you know, these are new positions, right? New roles, uh, the impact on organizational structure um, you know, Andrew, I know you've gone the transition from the baseball ops side to now the business ops side. Um, and, you know, the, the inside of a team, obviously, there's silos. You know, it's like I work in tickets. I work in even more granular. I work in group sales. Um, you know, and be curious of, of how the organizational structure, especially under Mark's uh, leadership, has evolved um, at the Indians. Yeah, and that's probably human instinct, right? Your first reaction is, how is this going to impact me? Um, and then to your point, I think the overall education, you know, right, of, um, of, of getting it into its revenue. Uh, and that's, that's, that's the whole uh, perspective. How, how early is it safe to say are you in the process of the organizational change? Uh, I mean, it's still relatively early. Dan, from a, from a league perspective, obviously um, people have been with, with teams for a long time, watching these organizational structures change now. Um, you know, from your perspective, what are you seeing and, and, and what does a team business operation look like five years from now? Uh, well, that, that, that would be hard for me to say. I think, you know, probably Andrew would be better, better suited to, uh, to predict that. Yeah, so <laughs> jump in right now. But. Uh, you know, I could just talk about the evolution of, of sort of from where I've sat at, at the league level and where I sit at the league level and sort of how things have changed in the 10 years I've been there. I mean, it's been pretty stark. I mean, when I came in, it was, it was a pretty quaint operation. It was just me, frankly. Uh, so I, I was the one research guy in the entire sort of at the league level. Um, and again, was really focused very narrowly on, on what was the sort of the big money maker for our, for our, from our from the league business, which was our TV rights. You know, and that was really where it was at for me. And, uh, spent a lot of time studying that. Um, and again, uh, over time, as we sort of proved our value, added to a couple of people, um, and sort of grew our resource, you know, we've really taken on a variety of, of other roles. And I think, you know, over that time, we've seen technology evolve. I mean, I think that's an enormous part of, of both the challenge and the tool, right? So as, as, as the marketplace becomes more complex, people have more ways to entertain themselves, more ways to buy tickets. The secondary market's a good example of that. 
Um, yet that, that same technology allows us to learn so much more about who they are, what they're doing, that the digital space is a good example of that. So, um, you know, I'm certainly not answering your question. Um, Andrew's going to do that in a second. But, um, <laughs> you know, from where I sit, where I sit, it's really been a, a very sort of a dynamic uh, uh, sort of change over, over the course of time. And, you know, I think it's, you know, you asked sort of when that sort of the system gets into place. I, I think it's, I think the answer is never. I think it's sort of, it's always going to continue to evolve. And, um, you know, the, the challenges that, that we'll face as an industry will will continue to change and the ways that we address those through better understanding our marketplace, better understanding our consumers and how we service them is, is also uh, going to be continually fluid. I appreciate now, that. Now uh, I'm going to not answer the question in a slightly different way. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to say that it depends. I don't think there's any one way that we're going to see organization you know, five or ten years from now. Uh, whether it's uh, baseball operations or an entire organization or a Fortune 500 company, every company does things slightly differently. They have different challenges and different legacies and different you know, cultures. So, uh, you know, I think there will be maybe some more emphasis on data or some different positions like you know, some of us have up here, but I'm not sure there's going to be one specific way that things are structured. Well, I think the one big change <coughs> that at least I've seen even in the last five years on the team side is, you know, it used to be, and in some, in some teams you still do get this, that you know, the business side is a necessary evil. There's the player side and the, and the baseball ops or you know, whatever sport it may be. And if the team wins, we'll sell tickets and we'll sell merchandise and we'll sell concessions and everything will be great. And you're starting to see, a, and you're definitely seeing a shift on teams towards saying, you know what, there are things we can do to kind of better run this as a business. And, you know, we can try to drive the most sales or the most merchandise revenue or whatever it is, regardless of how the team's playing on the field. And, you know, hopefully it'll all come around, or as I was talking about with Andrew before, if you can win, you know, if you can make more money on the business ops side, you can invest that in the team, and then hopefully you can win some more games, and then make more money on the business ops side, and it's a cycle. And I think you're starting to see teams really start to recognize that, and really run the team like a business, not just sort of a necessary evil that needs to happen in order for the product on the field. Yeah, so here from, from your perspective, too. Yeah, I mean, if I, if I could make a prediction here, I, I think it, I think one trend you'll see continue is more uh, sharing of information, best practices between teams. I think that's one thing the NBA has done a, a pretty good job of in terms of from the, uh, the league perspective, having a centralized organization that really works with all the teams, can look at data across all the teams and, and really surface or circulate best practices. Uh, I mean, that really speeds the learning curve for a lot of different organizations. So I think that's something you'll, you'll see uh, continue more and more. Can, can you, a lot of baseball people obviously in the room, give an uh, overview of um, the way that the league office is, uh, is structured and the resources back to people like you? Uh, sure. I mean, so, you know, the, the NBA has a, an organization called Team Marketing and Business Operations, and they serve as, uh, you know, uh, resources. Uh, each team has a, has a representative aligned to that, to that, uh, to that organization. And, uh, you know, they, they, they tend to hold, uh, you know, regular meetings. We have, you know, monthly conference calls. Uh, there was a, a big conference at uh, MIT Sloan uh, this past weekend, and the NBA held, held a business analytics workshop the day before. Uh, so about, I think, 28 teams were in attendance. And, uh, you know, it's just they do a good job of sort of, um, you know, pulling out case studies from specific teams. Uh, if there's areas that, uh, you know, or lessons that are applicable across multiple teams, then uh, they do a good job of surfacing and sharing those. So, again, so each team doesn't have to sort of, uh, you know, uh, figure things out on their own. I think it's a good, uh, good way to sort of, as I said, uh, uh, shorten the learning curve for, for everyone. Even though uh, Dan just pointed the last question to me, I'm actually going to tell him more with this group right now. Uh, the, the Tebow work at, at the NBA has been uh, certainly recognized in terms of the, the best practices sharing the work gets done on a league-wide basis. That's essentially what Dan's group is doing. And two years ago, we had no centralized information uh, from a team perspective. perspective has been very helpful to not only share information across you know, a set of teams, but also to have uh, a centralized form of information that we can now access on a group basis. I'll take Andrew's next question, <laughs> <laughs> just for that. 
Well, and, and, and you know what, it's a, it's a great, it's a great segue and, and certainly I'll, um, after this question, uh, open it up to the audience for questions as well. Um, but, um, you know, Dan, from, from your perspective, um, you know, obviously the, the first two days of this event, large focus on the baseball ops side. Uh, when we were at the GM panel on uh, Friday morning, um, those guys were tight-lipped about what, what they're studying, competitive advantages. Uh, obviously there's a saying that, um, you know, all these teams compete on the field, but off the field, they're all in the same business, uh, you know, essentially, and you are, you know, really kind of the, uh, the chairman, um, you know, from that perspective. To be, I just gave you a new title. You got a promotion. <laughs> no, there's compensation that goes Exactly. Um, I'll, I'll get on, I'll, you can yes. use me as a reference. Great. Okay. Um, but, um, you know, from, from your perspective, and obviously being with this, the ticket committee from the Commissioner Seelig has put together, you know, talk about the sharing of best practices and um, that importance, again, stuff that you see on the business side that probably on the baseball side, the guys would be much more tight-lipped about. Sure, I think uh, Andrew, you know, and, and Andrew certainly shares uh, the credit and the success of that group. Uh, he and, and the Indians have been integral, in, integrally involved in it, as have the Kansas City Royals, which of music's in the audience today. Um, and Jacqueline Parks, who's my boss, has really been the, 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 the driving force behind it, and I've sort of drafted behind her, but now that everyone's been thanked. Uh, you know, it's a group that really has, uh, I think, um, you know, delved in, dove in, has dived in to, um, to all of the, the, the information and, and, and uh, you know, the business strategies uh, that, that the league employs on a club, from a club to club basis. And you know, the data, frankly, is at sort of the heart of that. So um, you know, there's so much information r related to ticketing and so much nuance to that business um, that um, you know, the, the committee really, I think, was a necessary um, you know, a group to help sort of help understand all that data, understand all of the different business styles and practices that are being implemented around the league and to identify the, the best practices uh, that, that can be shared uh, among the clubs and develop tools that sort of harness all of that information and insight that, that clubs can use to better implement um, you know, their business strategies relative to ticketing. Uh, and so while on the business operations side, obviously the competitive element that, um, that's sort of that, that, that side of the business is cloaked in uh, is a little bit different from the, from the business side. You know, our clubs have been very eager to learn from one another, share with uh, one another, and been very generous, I think, in the way that um, they participated uh, in the committee's work. So, you know, it, it is one aspect of our business, uh, you know, the ticketing side of our business, um, but certainly it's a, it's a model that uh, can be and, and has be, been to some degree exported to other areas of our business. Uh, and, you know, the, uh, the sort of the, the rising tide ro rises all boats or something like that. Uh, and I think that the ticketing committee has been a, a good um, a group to, to help uh, do just that uh, on the, uh, as, re as regards to ticketing. Well, and, and I think is, is the right comment or question five, ten years ago, you could have a smaller market team look at something that a, a large market team is doing and the general comment, oh, that would never work with us. And then now you look at the data and you can adapt and, and learn models that, that do work, right? Right, and I think you know, clubs are, are, are generally uh, most interested in, in looking at their competitive set or at least the teams that they, they perceive to be their competitive set based on the marketplace dynamics, size of market, et cetera. Uh, but I think there are universal principles uh, and practices that can be uh, socialized across the league. So um, you know, there are, uh, you know, it's not a one size fits all solution in most cases, but there are certainly things that all the clubs can learn from one another and we're really just uh, at the league level hoping to facilitate uh, sort of that, that, that dialogue. Great, I think we're, we're just a little over the halfway point. Um, we'd love to open it up for some questions. That's not that's not a thing we've you know we've seen anyone do or really kind of advised about. One of the things that we've seen, um, you know, I kind of wish I could be sitting here saying something else, but when you start getting into situations like that, it's not necessarily price that's sort of the driving force that's going to get extra people into the ballpark. You know, it is, you know, it may be marketing. We listen to a lot of se sessions about different ways to try to reach fans, and a 
lot of those things do have much more of an impact at that point than price. Because typically you do see prices for most teams going down to 5 or $10 as the entry point to the ballpark. So what we actually try to focus on in those sort of lower demand situations or that sort of bottom falling out situation like you talked about is moving people around the ballpark. So maybe we're at a point where we don't think that dropping that overall price level will get more fans coming in. But can we make it so that, you know, again, if we're not having a lot of fans come, that we're not forcing people to sit in the top of the upper deck because there's seats, there's seats below that are available? And can we adjust these relative prices that get people moving out into better areas of the ballpark? And at least get the people that are coming to have a better experience. And from the team side, hopefully spend a little more, but at least, again, continue coming and get, have a better experience come out of that. Yeah, I mean, I would just echo, I think Barry makes, Barry makes several really good points there. Uh, you know, I think the only thing I would add is that, um, you know, from our perspective, we try to be uh, fairly conservative in our, our on-sale pricing to try to sort of minimize the risk of, you know, where we drop so low that we really cut into the, the member or the season ticket holder uh, value proposition in terms of price. Um, so I think sort of that, that's been our strategy to be relatively conservative, use dynamic pricing to capitalize on unexpected increases in demand. Uh, but I think what you touched on, Barry, in terms of, uh, you know, in areas where you have less than, you don't have excess demand, uh, sort of shifting consumers around different areas of the stadium, that's a really exciting uh, area for us. Yeah, question. Um, so you could say dynamic pricing was kind of like a disruptive innovation, you know, in 2007, 2008, 2009. Um, what do you guys think might be the next big disruptive innovation when it comes to uh, the fan experience and one that, like, say, generates revenue? Um, so, I mean, you know, from, from my perspective, and this is going to be kind of ticketing focus, so I'll let everyone else kind of chime in with maybe non-ticketing or other ticketing related things. But I think in terms of sales, I think you're going to start seeing distribution be, be one of the key pieces. I mean, there's, there's a lot of research being done right now. Um, you know, again, if you were to listen to the Scarborough presentation before, kind of how you segment different types of fans. But we don't have a way to reach them differently. You know, right now, a lot of what we do with dynamic pricing is coming up with a set of offers that are going to be seen by all fans and trying to make sure that there's something in there that appeals to each group. But we don't have the ability to really target different fans differently. And a lot of that's just the way ticketing is set up right now. I think what you will see over the next couple of years is a big shift toward multiple distribution channels and ways that we can go out and reach different fans through different channels. So you can have an offer to a single type of fan and that doesn't need to actually be seen by everyone else. And I think once you start doing that, I think that will actually be the thing that helps to really drive attendance much more than we've been able to do on a pricing side so far. I would add di uh, digital ticketing being also uh, sort of in that same realm, right? So, you know, uh, for the longest time, you know, we knew who bought the ticket, but we don't know who actually uses that ticket, nor do we know how that ticket may change hands among the, the original purchaser and then the ultimate end user of that ticket. Uh, and I think the digital, sort of the, the digital sphere allows for us to, to, to better track that usage to better understand who, um, you know, what the behaviors of that end user are, and again, collect uh, additional, you know, uh, leads along the way uh, as that ticket is, it changes hands before it's actually scanned at the turnstile. So I think uh, that type of insight that's going to be gathered throughout that process is going to be uh, enable us to do sort of what Barry's talking about is to really target in a more laser-focused way um, our marketing communications to that fan based on his or her uh, behavior. So uh, I think that that's another, uh, another uh, tool that will really help uh, revolutionize, maybe that's too strong a word, but, but maybe it isn't, um, you know, that, that segment of our industry. And, and I would jump in just with you know, something Dan said and, and something Barry said. We're looking at it as who are our customers. We're spending a ton of time trying to figure out who those customers are, what are their buying behaviors, and why do they come to our game. And that ties into digital ticketing into a lot of the, the work that we talked about earlier in segmentation. Uh, who are the customers? What are the products that they're interested in buying? And then how do we most effectively price those products? So the dynamic pricing is certainly part of the, the third thing. So we have a long way to go in, in who and how to price. So I think the, the third leg there is what are the products that they really want to buy? Because we focused on pricing the products we have currently. 
of thought for uh, jumping into the future. I, I think uh, you guys have taken all the good ones. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, I think uh, absolutely learning more about our customers, uh, whether that's through the um, sort of the paperless digital tickets. Um, I think that's, for me, that's, that's probably the, the most exciting area. Question from Go here. Lily for, for Andrew. How do you understand the concept of moving fans down um, to fill seats, things like that? How do you do that logistically? Do you issue an open invitation to fans on the school board to come on down? Do you dial back the usher police? And <laughs> how does that work? Yeah, um, I mean, there's a number of ways you could do it. That would certainly be one of them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, there are seat upgrade uh, softwares that we're looking at, uh, software that we're looking at right now, but primarily it's, it's through pricing. So we basically, you know, try to manipulate prices in the, you know, the cheaper areas of the ballpark, uh, raise those prices, and then lower other prices to make it a, a relative value for some someone to actually say, you know what, I don't usually get to sit in the field box, but it's only a couple dollars more than uh, this other section, so I'm going to spend a couple of extra dollars, and uh, they get a better seat. incremental value of having people sitting in an area uh, that looks good on TV or that helps us from a staffing perspective consolidate where the fans are sitting, but we primarily focus on the front end. We yeah, get here so and then we'll come over. I have two questions. One is a follow-up to some of the digital ticketing and kind of more of the targeting thing that you talked yeah. about. Um, so I'm just trying to understand what an example of that would be. So is that something like um, someone buys tickets to one of the teams now using the Pass Plus app, right? So uh, you're able to, so let's say someone is following the team on an on, on, on MLB at bat, they, they purchase their ticket you know, through that, uh, the certain number of minutes or hours before the game, they use the app, the Pass Plus app to access the stadium. And so is the idea that, okay, this is this kind of consumer, someone who may make a last minute decision, maybe less price sensitive, I mean, is it to kind of that level where pricing Kind of well, I think I think we could eventually get there. I mean, when I was saying it, I was talking even a lot, a lot simpler. Okay. I mean, think about for a second when you go to buy a ticket for an airline. There's about you know a hundred different places you could go to buy that same ticket. You know, different websites, travel agents. You know, you're getting hit from different directions. You might, you know, some of them you might have more of an affiliation to. It might be through your credit card or you know ro loyalty rewards or anything like that. But there's there's different people that you have a relationship with, not all of them. And they're able to come out and find you. Right now on a ticketing side, we do a terrible job with that. But if you want to get a Cleveland Indians ticket, for example, I mean, they do, there is a lot of marketing that goes on, but it's done by the team, it's done by baseball. So you've got to go to Indians.com or MLB.com or Ticketmaster.com. You have to be searching for that product. There isn't an ability for someone to come out there, again, not the team spending their own money, but a third party who's willing to invest that marketing spend, who might have a relationship with you, to come out and find you. And you know those people know their customer, they have different reach. So what I'm talking about is actually getting more to a world like an airline ticket or like a hotel ticket, where that distribution is kind of opened up. And again, the teams can leverage you know different companies spending, doing their own marketing spend to try to reach you. And then again, those different companies know their different clientele and can target you differently than you know a group, you know, a different company that maybe I have an affiliation with or someone else in the room has an affiliation with. Does that make sense? I'm not sure I understand why you know some other company is going to be incentivized to get you in a ballpark seat. Like that, that seems kind of ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, well, t I mean, typically the way these things work is that you know there is some sort of service fee on a ticket or whatever it is, so they're they are getting some amount of revenue for doing that. And you do see it on the secondary market right now. There are a ton of companies on the secondary market side that are going out there and trying to reach fans and and sell them tickets. And they've done a great job in terms of increasing the market share on the secondary market side. Oh, I see. So, you know, I mean, I think if you ask me kind of why the secondary's grown, it's not, it's not as much, part of it's price, um, but part of it's also, it's just as big a reach. So companies are out there, they do want to be in the business of selling tickets. And, how can the teams and the leagues leverage that? Can I just ask a separate question? Yeah. 
Um, I'm curious, going back to the ticketing committee, uh, how that works, how that worked um, in terms of information flow when you had teams that actually compete in the same market. So, Cubs and White Sox, Mets and Yankees, you know, so, you know, for the most part, as a whole, the teams aren't necessarily competing against each other um, like they are for, on the field, but, uh, you know, for example, when you're not playing San Francisco, you know, there's so much talk about the A's moving and, you know, what's the ticket base for the Giants and how much are they going to move and, you know, that's, like, a lot of people kind of <laughs> want to know, you know, know that info, so I was kind of wondering just even internally kind of how that Sure, I, I mean, obviously we're very respectful of the clubs uh, and what, you know, their you know, marketplace situations right. are and what information they're willing to share and, and not willing to share, but I think, you know, uh, and so I think on, on the whole, um, you know, they've been very, you know, generous with their willingness to uh, to share information. Um, you know, I, we recognize the competitive aspects that may, you know, prevail in, in certain markets, though, um, that are competing in different leagues, um, nevertheless. Um, we have been, you know, I think very, very happy with the way that um, clubs have seen the committee as a resource to, you know, share their best practices and get smarter based on learning from, from other clubs. And, and to kind of follow that up, so I mean, you know, we work with over 20 clubs right now, and so we, you know, we actually went to all of our teams at the end of last season and kind of did a recap, taking a look at overall ticket pricing and trends and then how they did on a dynamic pricing front and strategies that worked. And I think almost all of our teams participated at some level, kind of agreeing that they'd be willing to share their data in order to be able to see everyone else's. So I think you, you do see a lot of cooperation on that front, even in those cases. And to some extent, this isn't very proprietary. Even if the A's and Giants, let's say, are competing on the field, they still have access to a lot of the baseball statistics in common. It's really how they use those statistics. Right, although both those teams would say they have proprietary you know, quant on the baseball well, side. And all the teams doing the business side as well. Right. But a lot of what we're talking about is just relative basic information. Okay. I think we have the gentleman in the back, then we'll come to you. simple, straightforward answer of saying, where did you price your tickets on sale and what was the final price? Uh, that's not necessarily incremental revenue because as you're saying, some people may not have purchased. Right. That's a very difficult thing to prove, sort of the, the counterfactual, how many people would have bought tickets at other prices. So we're spending a lot of time looking at elasticity, trying to figure out at, at different changes in prices, uh, what are the projected uh, sales, and then cross elasticity we're not just moving prices on average up or down for the entire game, but within you know, cross sections. So if we move 
prices up in one section and down in another, what is that? What would we have projected for the changes in sales from that standpoint? So it's a relatively complicated process. I think those are some of the ways we're trying to attack it. Yeah, no, again, a, a very good question, very insightful. Uh, it is a difficult thing to measure, but uh, it can be measured. Uh, you know, other industries have figured it out. I mean, there's, there's ways to do sort of uh, pricing tests uh, to measure the, the elasticity uh, that uh, Andrew is speaking about. So, yeah, it, it's not a, not a trivial problem, but it's something that, that we can measure and we're working hard to, uh, to measure. I think we're, uh, we're getting in our, our five-minute window, so let's get our final questions in. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, you know, for the second part of your question, um, I, I can't really speak to if other teams are going to do it. Uh, for us, we saw it as a, a net positive. Um, you know, I think um, if you look at the, uh, in terms of the uh, uh, the number of people who actually requested their, their money back, it was, it was actually quite small, um, you know, less than, less than 5%, closer to 1%. Uh, so it was actually, uh, you know, in terms of uh, uh, the risk there, it was actually minimal. You know, I think in terms of the, uh, the publicity and sort of the, uh, uh, the spirit of, you know, listen, we stand behind our product. And, uh, you know, this is a way to demonstrate that to the market. I think that was really the goal. And I think that came across in terms of the, the media coverage and, and the response to it. So I think uh, for us, we saw it as a positive. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure we'd, we'd do it again, but I think sort of the, uh, it was more about the statement of we stand behind our product and, uh, you know, we're willing to, uh, you know, to put, our, put the money on. Yeah, I, you know, certainly baseball is not immune to sort of the economic landscape that uh, prevails behind it. But, um, you know, we have seen remarkably um, solid ticket sales numbers year to year since the start before and since the start of the recession. I mean, it's really, you know, around 75 million tickets uh, per year. And it's really a testament to, to our clubs, frankly, and, and the salespeople at those clubs and the amazing job that they do selling 81 games a year, um, creatively packaging uh, and pricing those tickets. Uh, and so certainly, you know, Andrew outlined it well, um, some of the considerations uh, and some of the impacts uh, that the economy has, uh, has uh, sort of resulted in. Uh, but, you know, from a, from a league perspective in aggregate, our ticket sales have been, have been a, a remarkably robust and weathered. Uh, the economic downturn turned quite well. And that, again, is really a testament to the amazing work that our, our, the folks at our clubs uh, do. Yeah, I think we're right on our window, so we'll do one last question. Uh, 
Uh, you know, I, I can't speak obviously for the Chicago Bulls, but I think uh, you know we we're very cognizant of that, the Phoenix Suns, and we try to uh, have a, a variety of options. So maybe there's a game where the, the cheapest ticket starts at, at, at the price point you mentioned, but there there are many other games where the tickets start you know at the ten dollar level, right? So I think uh, you know, I mean, the fact of the matter is sort of our pricing tries to reflect market demand, right? So we're not sort of inventing this or creating it. It's it's reflecting what what the market is saying, right? So that's sort of the uh, the clearing price for a ticket. You know, that, that's what it is. So, but I, I think that, you know you do make a good point about you have to sort of balance that with uh, sort of being able to sort of bring new customers in, younger customers, people who don't have that that sort of spending uh, uh, capacity. So that's that's something we struggle with, and we're trying to uh, uh, to get it right as best we can. Well, I'm, not, I'm not doubting that that's the demand. I'm just saying that as you become fewer and fewer of these customers becoming more apt and have not, and if they have not grow, they'll be watching. Uh, Absolutely. So every team, every team, no, I'm at, what is it, 1,000 tickets a game, or is it? Yeah, we're required a certain oh, number. Okay, they must have been pulled up. Yeah, well, I mean, and that, but no, but that is one of the problems, right? When, you're, when, you, when you are underpricing the market, you know, we do live in a world right now with a pretty big secondary market where people do look for those opportunities on mispriced tickets, and that, one of the biggest problems isn't necessarily having those affordable tickets, but in a situation like that, how do you make sure those tickets get to the right person? and don't end up on the secondary market being sold for more than $75. Yeah, and, and we at Major League Baseball uh, have a, a concerted effort to um, distribute tickets to uh, underserved youths and community uh, organizations. And so that is something we're very mindful of. Uh, and I think we've done a, a pretty good job of, of making sure that, um, you know, through our, our community partners uh, that we distribute tickets to, particularly kids, obviously they're really important to uh, sort of the lifeblood of our game to make sure that um, we make those uh, those uh, experiences available to those who may not otherwise be able to afford them. Great, well, uh, I think the, the ringtone was our sign that we are uh, up against, uh, but uh, we've got some gifts for our attendees uh, from Sabre, and please give everyone a round of applause for our dream team up here.